thanks uh, again for joining us for the class. Uh, I guess this is the third one for this uh, this second sort of round, and uh, we're we're going today to look at uh, the end of Revelation chapter six. Um, so basically, the content of today's class, we're going to do a little a short section um, called a clue to women. And you'll notice that throughout this series, there have been little breakout sessions on different clues to the book of Revelation, and this certainly is one of them. And then we're going to um, look at the sixth seal. The sixth seal, um, we, we covered the first five last week, and this week we looked at, we're going to look at the sixth. I'm not going to have time to deal with section 20, but I do encourage you to look at your notes, um, the notes of Brother Max sent and uh, to, to read up in that section. So just looking at this section here, this is um, this uh, symbol of a woman you'll find has got its roots in the in the Old Testament. Um, when I when I first came into the truth, I remember Brother Keith Jamison told me a simple truth and he said this, he said, the book of Revelation is the story about a woman. And I sort of didn't know too much what he meant at that stage, but uh, now I certainly do. And let's explore what he meant by the book of Revelation is the story about a woman. Um, on that picture there, that's a picture of uh, myself and Delita when we were just, just before we got married. Um, actually, it really looks like me a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, that's another story. Uh, sorry, when I had hair. Uh, the, so, um, and we find that right back in the, in the beginning, uh, we, we read about Adam and Eve. And, and so this, this symbol of a woman, ju not just a New Testament concept, it's been used throughout all the scriptures. Uh, Eve was created out of the side of Adam. And, and whilst he was put into a deep sleep, uh, Eve was created. And just likewise, I guess, uh, the ecclesia was brought to life after the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the second Adam was put into a deep sleep. And so, uh, and so the symbol of the woman is then carried on in, the, in Genesis 3.15, the, the seed of the woman. And the woman becomes a symbol of the nation of Israel, who was God's chosen ecclesia in the Old Testament. And it carries on into the New Testament um, with the Gentile believers called the woman. And so um, then you, you may remember this story in the Old Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, uh, sorry, just one second. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah, so so you'll find that uh, this there's a story that's told in Ezekiel chapter 16. Actually, we might just turn there for the moment. We're not going to read the the words of Ezekiel uh, 16, but just turn to there just to to get yourself glancing over the passage uh, in Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh, Ezekiel 16 is this story. Um, about a, um, it's a story about this young deserted baby girl that God discovers and takes himself. And it says uh, in verse, uh, it, it says, verse three, it says, thus says the Lord Yahweh to Jerusalem, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, your mother a Hittite, as for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you, nor were you rubbed with salt, nor swathed in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field. And this, this baby was dying, it was, 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 was deserted. And, and the story goes that God took this baby girl and he, uh, and he clothed the baby. He nourished the child. 
And then as the child grew, he looked after her and gave her uh, many gifts. And this child grew up to be a beautiful woman. And, um, you know, she, she was so beautiful that she became famous internationally even. But her fame and, uh, and her beauty uh, got to her head. And this is what it says. Uh, this is what it says here. It says, I made you thrive like a plant in the field and you grew, matured and became very beautiful. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord Yahweh. I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood. I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth. And actually, what does that remind you there? Doesn't that remind you of when uh, we were baptized and entered? God entered into a covenant with us? Um, and didn't he clothe us with righteousness, um, if you like, in that, in that symbol? But unfortunately, so I was going to say this, what this what this uh, little girl, uh, this girl represented, this woman who grew up uh, afterwards, was this represented Israel, the nation of Israel, and uh, and, it, and it and it really encompassed the story of Israel. But sadly, this woman grew up to become a harlot, and it says in Ezekiel sixteen, "You trusted in your own beauty, you played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out harlotry." on everyone passing by who would have it. And so Israel worshipped idols. She sacrificed her sons and daughters uh, and became very unfaithful to the one who kindly brought her up. In Ezekiel 23, um, it's a, a little, another sort of play on this story. It's the story of Ahola and Aholaba. And, and what this, this is a story about two harlot sisters. And these two women are representative of Samaria, um, which is the capital of Israel, and Jerusalem, which is the capital of Judah. And so the symbol of a harlot therefore represents an unfaithful ecclesia um, who has corrupted the worship of God. And I guess, in, and, and so in the New Testament, we wouldn't expect the symbol to be any different. Um, the book of Revelation speaks about a time when the Lamb, uh, Jesus Christ, is going to take the bride to himself. In Revelation 19, um, oh, sorry, I'll just go to the next, uh, sorry, I'll just read that, sorry, let me read that quote there. It says, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul said to the Ecclesia in Corinth. But he also warned them and said, he said, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so in Revelation 19, this theme of a bride for Christ continues. But in chapter 19, it's, it's sort of like the end of the story. It's, uh, we, we find that... Um, we find it speaks about a time when there is the marriage of the lamb. Uh, and it reads like this. It says, let us be glad and rejoice for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And so, uh, and, and this is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth and he will unite with his faithful bride. Um, he will invite her to conquer the nations. He will allow her to rule the earth with him. And in contrast to that, in the book of Revelation, um, we read about a, um, a woman who does become corrupt. And, and here's, a, here's a slide uh, we show in, the, in our seminars. We show that the book of Revelation, it, it sees this transition of a, a woman who becomes corrupted, and she, she's pure to begin with, like, like we read in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. She's described that, that the Apostle Paul describes her as a chaste virgin. Um, but we find in Revelation 12 that she's no longer a virgin. She's now with child. 
And then uh, we find by the time we get to Revelation chapter 17, we find that um, she becomes a harlot who rides on the Roman beast. And so, um, and so we have uh, the book of Revelation is not just the story about one woman, it's actually the story about two women. It's, uh, it, we, we find there that uh, it, the, the harlot is a, the system that corrupted God's teaching. It's a system that got involved in politics when it should have refrained from such. It, it was a system that killed with the sword when it wasn't permitted to. It's, it was, the, the woman wasn't in a state where it was ready to take on politics. That will only come when Christ returns. And so here we have a system that's the, the counterfeit of Christ. It has a counterfeit, a counterfeit ruler. It has, a, it has counterfeit teachings. And it also has a counterfeit God. The book of Revelation is therefore a story about two women. One is a beautiful, gentle, Christ-like brother and sister in Christ. The other is a corrupt, unfaithful, worldly, and sensual religion that has deceived the whole world. And so that's, that little section there, just a clue there, that symbol of a woman is, uh, is certainly prevalent in the book of Revelation. And it'll actually give us a bit of a clue when it comes to Revelation 12. Now, today we're only going to just briefly mention Revelation 12. That's going to be the subject of another class. But the rest of the, today's class is we're going to look at the, the sixth seal. So before we, sorry, before we look at the, um, the sixth seal, let's just revise the first five seals. And so you may remember that um, the first seal covered a period of about 80 years. Uh, it's the white horse period, which, which represented um, God waging warfare on the Roman Empire. Not uh, literal warfare, but it was a spiritual warfare, wearing the, um, the, the weapons of a spiritual warrior. And that's where the truth was proclaimed on the empire in a, in a time of relative peace uh, for, the, for, the whole, for the Roman Empire. You may remember the, the, the phrase from Gibbon, it was, uh, it was the golden age. It was, the, it was the age in history uh, that he, he noted. He said, if, if, if a man had to look at a period of time in the history of the world, this is the time you really wanted to live in for, for a time of peace and stability. And then in the second seal, peace was taken from the earth. And it was, uh, we, we, it was the age of the Machaira, the great sword, not in its size, but in its use. And it's... Uh, where there was a, so much civil unrest and civil war in the Roman Empire at the time. The third seal was the, uh, was the, the Black Horse seal. And that was a time when there would be heavy taxes uh, put on by the Roman administration, which led to fuel, uh, sorry, fuel shortages, food shortages and, uh, and depression. And then the fourth seal, was that pale chlor chloritic green horse, the color which someone who is about to die turns often. And, and so this, was the, this brought about the near death of the Roman Empire. Uh, it was a time where, where death was prevalent. In fact, 39 emperors were killed. And there was an epidemic also at that time, which killed up to 5,000 people per day just in the city of Rome. And... And, uh, and we also had the barbarian tribe starting to uh, make inroads on the borders of the empire. And then we read about the fifth seal. And that was the time of severe persecution of Christians under the reign of the emperor Diocletian. Um, the the, the uh, emperors Galerius and, and, and Maximum, who were co-emperors in the empire at the time they severely persecuted christians in their jurisdictions of the empire and the believers prayed how long for deliverance and now we come to the sixth seal 
Um, and so, so just to, to summarize here, uh, just to reinforce this, this thing about the earthquakes, because in the sixth seal, we're going to read about the first great earthquake. Um, and, uh, and so what we have here, just to establish that foundation, the, these, this is the, the, the three great earthquakes are like three foundation pegs you just cannot move in the book of Revelation. They represent three great events, earth shattering events that happened uh, that in, or will happen in the Roman Empire. The first one is happening in AD 324. We're going to read about that shortly. All right? That was the change in the empire. Its administration and its uh, and its its religion was going to be changed from pagan to Christian Rome in AD 324. And then uh, and it remained as a Christian Roman Empire and became more and more Christian. Um, Christianity became the state religion, and I think it was in about the year 380. Uh, and it remained like that until the French Revolution. In the French Revolution, things changed dramatically, not just for the, not just for Europe, but for the whole world. This, uh, the spirit of, um, uh, I've forgotten it already, uh, equality, fraternity, uh, and I've missed one. Uh, liberty, liberty, equality, and fraternity, the three frog-like spirits come out of the French Revolution and have actually pervaded the whole world with those teachings. And so what we have then is a period of democratic Rome. And then we have Christ coming in that period, the, at the time of feet of iron and clay. And we find that the third great earthquake will come, and that will be when Rome is destroyed. It's talking about the 40-year period after Armageddon, when the kingdoms of men will become the kingdom of God. And here we have the, the symbol, uh, sorry, the, the seals, where we have the first five seals that we just spoke about. Today, we're going to look at the sixth seal. And at the end of the sixth seal, it brings in the seventh seal, which will herald in the seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets become the great judgments on the, the East and the Western Roman Empire. And in the seventh trumpet, we have the pouring out of the seven vials. And we are now living at the, towards the end of the sixth vial. The, that's when Christ is going to come. Christ is going to come here. So we have a period of time period from AD 96. Um, the first uh, earthquake is going to occur in 324. That's when, the, that's when the sixth seal ends and brings in the seventh seal. And then we have the, the, uh, the, the seventh trumpet sounds in the year 1789, when there was the next great earthquake. And then we'll have Christ coming at the final earthquake. So hopefully that all sort of makes sense. So what we're looking for today is a period of time leading up to 324 AD. And on that note, I'm going to ask Brother Michael if he could please read uh, Revelation chapter uh, 6, verses 12 to 17. So Revelation 6, verses 12 to 17. Okay. And I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of, the, from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come 
and who is able to stand. All right, thanks, Michael. And so, so when you read um, this sixth seal, and I, I guess it would have been good to read it in the context of all the other ones, you, you, the, the, what you see is really, really dramatic. Like the, um, the little title in my Bible says, Six Seal Cosmic Disturbances. And, and, and you, you read about this great earthquake, the sun becoming black, um, and you read about the moon becoming like blood, the stars of heaven falling to the earth, uh, and then and and and, and, it's, and it's being shaken. Um, uh, it, it's it's as, as if as if as if you know shaken like a fig tree, and the, the fig trees are the figs are dropping on the earth. That's what the stars are falling like. The sky receding as a scroll gets all rolled up and gets thrown away. That's pretty dramatic uh, language that's used here. And, and so we read about the first of the three great earthquakes that's going to occur in the book of Revelation. And they're called earthquakes because they affect every level of society, from the noble to the peasant, from the ruler to the priest, from the farmer to the soldier. And earthquakes also represent the speed and shock of the change that's going to occur. I mean, if you lived in the reign of Diocletian, which was a period, a relative period of peace, not for the not for the Christians, but it was for the empire, you would you would not be expecting what was about to happen next. And in just a few years, the Roman Empire was going to change dramatically from a pagan dominated and Christian persecuted empire to one where the universal religion of Rome would become Christian or a corrupt form of it uh, called the Roman Catholic Church. And a man named Constantine was going to become the universal ruler of the whole empire. And he not only was going to allow Christianity to be practiced, he also elevated Christians into positions of power. He facilitated meetings to uh, to discuss differences of doctrine, to try and unite the beliefs of Christians. He did it for the sake of peace and unity in the empire, not because he loved truth. But unfortunately, this would lead, uh, this would lead to a corrupted form of Christianity. And the birth of this Christian champion was about to take place. So let's see how it happened. Um, Sorry, I, that should have been the slide I was talking on there. So we have a, um, uh, we need to look at some of these symbols here. It, where it talks about the sun becoming dark and the moon becoming like blood and the stars of heaven falling, etc., cetera, et cetera. Where, where have we seen these symbols before? We need to look at the Old Testament to see if this symbology has been used before and how it was used. Um, I'll ask a question of the class here. This prophecy of the, in the, on the screen here, I'll read it out. I just want you to tell me where, where, this, where, this, where um, this is quoted in the Bible um, and, and what it's talking about. It says, Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. Where's that quoted in, in the Bible? Which book at least? Would anyone like to take a guess? Delita told me the right answer. It's because we talked about this the other day. I don't think this is right, but to me it feels a bit... Oh, sorry, we got the volume turned down. Sorry, um, I'm just going to turn it up again. So, what was your what was your answer there? Uh, my answer was that I don't think it's right, but it feels a bit like lamentations to me. Not oh, it's it, it, you'd be forgiven for thinking so, but not quite, not quite lamentations, but written by the same author. How about that? Jeremiah. Yes, that's Jeremiah. Now, if, by the way, if I have my TV running in the background, do you, are you getting an echo from me? That's okay oh, for us. Okay, tell me if it becomes a problem. We'll we'll keep the volume turned up. So, um, 
so here we, this is, this is actually a quote from Jeremiah um, chapter 25. And, and uh, I was hoping that you would actually say it was from Revelation chapter 18, because it almost sounds exactly the same. In Revelation 18, it uses that term, the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. The voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. See, the first one um, was talking, was describing Jerusalem. All right, Jeremiah, or God uh, telling, sorry, God telling Jeremiah what would happen to the city of Jerusalem. The second one on the bottom of your screen is God telling John what would happen to Rome or in fact, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And so we have very, very similar um, prophecies here. And so you can see the Old Testament and the New Testament link together. So when we see things like this, where there's, uh, sorry, the, the text is a little bit small here, where it says the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Well, that's actually quoted in Isaiah 13 about Babylon itself. Um, it's also mentioned in Joel um, and Matthew 24 about Judah, the nation of Judah. The moon became as blood. Well, that's, that's quoted in Joel about Judah. The stars of heaven falling to the earth. That's about Edom and Isaiah 34 and so on and so on. And you see these, these words, they, they, they hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the, the mountains and the rocks fall on us. And so these are quotes from the Old Testament about what would happen to the nations. And so in the sixth seal, we read about the sun being eclipsed, the stars falling, the moon becoming like blood. And um, so this great earthquake would be a political upheaval in the Roman world. And as a result, the sun would be eclipsed. Well, that's the, the emperors, the ones who are the, who are the greater lights in the empire. It would be the end of, of the pagan Roman emperors. The stars for falling. Well, the stars are the, are the uh, like we would use today, these are people who shine in government. They're the administrators of the Roman empire. The, that would be, represent the fall of the pagan administration in the Roman empire. And then the moon becoming like blood, well, that's talking about the death of the religious system, the pagan religious authority, because the moon gets its reflection off the sun. And so it was the, it was the um, pagan religious authority would, 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 uh, would die in the, uh, in the Roman Empire. Now, what we need to do is talk a little bit about history. It's all right, me sort of telling you, you know, that in summary, but how did this all happen? And I find it really interesting and, and researching this of how this all happened in such a short time. So a little bit of storytelling now. Um, so here is what the Roman Empire looked like in the year AD, 300 AD. Um, and so what we have uh, is a tetrarchy, right? A tetrarchy meaning four divisions of the Roman Empire. And this was Diocletian, the Emperor Diocletian's way of establishing a peaceful empire. And what he did was he divided Ro the Roman Empire into East and West. And what he had was in the East, he set himself up as the Augustus. So Diocletian was the Augustus of the Eastern Roman Empire. He was like the, the Augustus was the supreme ruler. And what he would do is he would set up a, a, a maybe a younger apprentice uh, ruler, a, an apprentice emperor who was called the Caesar. And, and the one he appointed was this man, uh, Galerius. Now, on the western side of the empire, the Augustus, or the guy at the top, his name was Maximian, and another one of these Maxes, all right? There's going to be lots of Maxes mentioned today. Um, and, and his apprentice, uh, or the, the, the second rank in the, in the Western Roman Empire, would be Constantius. 
Now, Constantius is the father of Constantine. And so, um, and you might be able to see there, that's how the empire was divided up. Con Constantius was over here. Um, it, if you like, that's sort of like the area of France, uh, or Western Europe today. And he also had uh, great, he had also had Britain. Um, Maximian ruled the Italian peninsula and Northern Africa and Spain. Galerius had this area, what was called Illyricum. So you could say it was the Balkans uh, and uh, what we'd know as Macedonia or Greece. And then uh, on, way over on the east was uh, Diocletian's part. So he had uh, Asia Minor, uh, Palestine and Egypt. And so that's how the, the empire was divided at the time. And the idea of having uh, this, this sort of second in charge guy, the apprentice, was that one day that the, uh, the number ones would, would abdicate the throne, in other words, they'd, they would uh, retire, and the number twos would uh, become the Augusti of the empire. So that's how the empire looked in the year 300 AD. And then we move on. Um, we move on uh, to here to uh, a little bit, six years later, to 306 AD. And uh, sorry, I'm gonna, yeah, here we go. So in, uh, in the West, Constantius, who was the apprentice, he's now elevated to the August, uh, as one of the Augusti. And number two is this other guy, Valerius Severus. Over in the East, we have promoted now Galerius with his um, number two is Maximinus. Now, this happened because uh, Diocletian, he went into early retirement and he abdicated, abdicated the throne. He gave up the throne. And that was actually the first, that was a bit of a first in Roman Empire or Imperial Roman history because uh, Diocletian was the first Roman emperor to do this. Um, other emperors either died of natural causes or a lot of them were actually murdered. So this triggered the promotion of the number twos to the number ones. Um, it was expected, however, that Constantine, who was Constantius's son, would become the number two over in the West. And it was expected um, that this other guy, um, uh, Max, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm re I've gone off my notes, I've sort of lost. Uh, he, he, so Maximinus wasn't the guy who was expected to be number two either. Uh, and so, so we have a bit of a problem. He's sort of changing the rules a little bit. And so that was going to become, as it turned out, the beginning of the end of the Tetrarchy. And in the next few years, things changed dramatically. So in the year 306, Constantius, this guy here, um, he, this Constantius died. And as a dying wish, Constantius declared his son Constantine as with the higher title of Augustus. I mean, he wasn't even on the list, yet as he was dying, he said, my son Constantine is going to be the Augustus of the Western Roman Empire. And that, that little uh, dying wish was uh, supported by the army. Uh, um, and, and it was also supported by Gaul, which is France, and Britain. But trouble was, when Constantine sent a notice over to Galerius in the east to say, listen, I'm the new Augustus of the Western Roman Empire, Galerius was furious. And, and uh, he wrote back and he said, uh-uh, he said, but I will accept your nomination as number two. And so Constantine, not wanting to be seen as a usurper, he, um, he, was, uh, he accepted the position of number two there. And in the year 311, 
this fella Galerius died. Now Galerius is famous or infamous for the guy who was the most instrumental in persecuting the Christians. Diocletian was influenced by this guy, Galerius, um, because Galerius was very much pro-pagan and he hated the Christians. Um, and, and it was because of Galerius that Diocletian um, started this, this persecution. And so, uh, and, and this guy Galerius dies in the year 311 and Gibbon uh, describes his death uh, in these words. He says, his disease was occasioned by a very painful lingering disorder. His body swelled by an intemperate, excuse the words, intemperate course of life to an unwieldy corpulence, was covered with ulcers, devoured by innumerable swarms of those insects who have given the name to a most loath loathsome disease. And so Galerius died a horrible, horrible death. And some have seen that as Galerius' death as God's vengeance on the man who severely persecuted the Christians. And so now we have the scene set for Constantine to take over the Roman world. And this is what it looks like now um, in, uh, have I got, yeah, sorry, in the, in the year 312 AD. We've now got the scene for this great political earthquake to occur in the sixth seal. This is where the sixth seal starts. So what we have is Constantine as the ruler in the West or the far West. And so Maxentius now um, is the, it usurped the throne uh, in Rome. And Lucinius, he's, um, he, he's the guy who was promoted by Galerius. Lucinius now, he is the uh, ruler here in, uh, in Illyricum and, and Macedonia. And way over on the east, you have Maximinus, the Augustus in the, in the east. And so uh, what we have, this is, this is now setting the scene for this part. Now, Constantine, what he's going to do He's going to take control over the whole of the Western Roman Empire. And so what he does is he moves with 40,000 of his men. That's about a quarter of his army. He crossed the Alps and descended onto the Italian peninsula. And Constantine's advisors told him not to go. They advised, said, look, don't do this. The gods are against you in doing this. Don't, don't do it. They cautioned him, but Constantine was determined to defeat Maxentius. And um, according to the church historian Eusebius, while Constantine was preparing to take Rome, he saw a vision of a cross in the sun. And with it, the words, en toto nica, it's in, in translated, in this sign, conquer. And at first, Con Constantine was unsure um, what the meaning of that apparition was. But in the following night, according to Eusebius, right, it's all speculative here, it's, uh, this, is, uh, this is all according to Eusebius, that Constantine had a dream in which Christ explained to him that he should use the sign against his enemies, which I guess we call it the sign of the cross. And so, um, and so Constantine had this symbol um, painted on the shields of his soldiers prior to the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And Eusebius says what he painted was the first two letters um, of Christ, of the Greek word Christos, which is that PX there on the bottom of your screen. Um, Oops, sorry. And so Milvian Bridge, this battle of Milvian Bridge was a real turning point in the history of Rome. Milvian Bridge is, is, uh, is uh, a bridge that crosses the Tiber River. You can see there, it's just on the, just on the outskirts of the city of Rome. This, it was a huge and decisive battle in which Constantine 
defeated Maxentius, another Max. Maxentius drowned as he tried to swim back across the Tiber River. And his body was, uh, was, was fished out of the river. He's, uh, he was decapitated and his head was paraded around the city of Rome. Here's another depiction of the Milvian Bridge battle. Um, and you can see there this coin was struck. Um, the, 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 you've, got, you've got Constantine, Maxentius here. And, um, and what we have here is this symbol, this, this insignia. Uh, I think they call it a Christogram with the first two letters of Christ, which, which became the insignia of Constantine and his army. You could even see that here on his helmet, his crown, the, the little, little PX there. So, so Constantine now has defeated Maxentius and he's now the, the, the ruler of the whole of the Western Roman Empire. And so the scene here is now set for Revelation chapter 12, which, by the way, is a parallel record of Revelation 6 verses um, 9, sorry, verses 12 to 17. It's a parallel record of the sixth seal. And so the earthquake of the sixth seal has begun. With the entry of Constantine into Rome, many so-called Christians uh, were now elevated uh, to positions of power. So, and meanwhile, in the East, Maximin, who, who was extremely anti-Christian, he provoked Licinius, who at this time was pro-Christian. Max, Maximin provoked Licinius and there was uh, an into civil war. And so, and what happened was, um, was that Licinius defeated Maximin. And so now we are left with just two emperors, Constantine in the west and Licinius, the ruler in the east. And the following year, these two, oh, sorry, in the, in the same year that he defeated uh, Maximian, Licinius went over to Milan, Milan in Italy, um, he, and, he, and he met Constantine and they forged their alliance together by, um, by marriage. Licinius married Constantine's half-sister, whose name was, surprise, surprise, Constantia. I don't know how they addressed themselves in that household, because there was Constantius, the dad, there was uh, Constantine, there was Constantia. I don't know how they would have, what they would have called each other. Um, but nevertheless, there was a, a, an alliance made that day with the, the marriage of Constantine's sister to Licinius. And on that particular uh, occasion, they, they made an agreement. These two emperors made an agreement. They called it the Edict of Milan. And the Edict of Milan, uh, what, this was pretty really important because this officially granted full tolerance to Christianity and all religions in the Roman Empire. And it also offered to grant the Christians restoration for all the property that was seized during the Diocletian's persecution. And this, this granted tremendous relief for, for Christians um, suffering at the hands of the empire. You know, those who are worshipping in secret could now come out of hiding. And, and, and you know, when we, when we think about that, we feel a sense of relief uh, on behalf of those people. The downside of that was it led to the eventual rise of the Roman Catholic Church. And Christians, or so-called Christians, instead of hiding from their persecutors, were now being placed into positions of influence and power. Pr Christians began to hold high offices in the empire and began to be get involved in politics. And after the Edict of Milan was issued, the relationship between the two emperors, Constantine and Licinius, deteriorated. 
A plot was made on Constantine's life by a, cle a colleague of Licinius, and this ended the unity uh, between Constant Constantine and Licinius, and, brought, and, woke, uh, sorry, and war broke out between the two. So Constantine, what he did was he invaded the Balkans and uh, in, in the year 316. And after the battle of the battles of Sibylle and Mardia, the possessed area of the Balkans, this area here, became part of Constantine's empire. And after this, Licinius, who was pro-Christian, he also turned against the Christians. He reneged on the Edict of Milan. And in opposition to Constantine's pro-Christian stance, Licinius also began to persecute the Christians in the Eastern Empire. Constantine was determined to defeat Licinius and take the whole empire. And after a further three major battles, Licinius was totally defeated in the year 324 AD. And so the earthquake of the sixth seal was complete. The Roman Empire had completely changed in just 12 years. Constantine got his wish, and now he was going to become the sole emperor of the entire Roman Empire. And I found this on YouTube here. It's just a little bit of a video. Uh, it only goes for a couple of minutes. It's just a video that just shows the, um, the transformation of the, of the empire here. I'll just play that there, from Diocletian to Constantine. And look in this corner here, this is the year, so the year 289, 290, 291. Diocletian now is going to set up his tetrarchy for two Augusti, two Caesars, four territories. And we're going to see how quickly this is going to change. This is now where the uh, the sixth seal begins. Isn't it amazing how quickly things change? Thanks to Mr. or Mrs. or Miss Millis for that. Um, and so here we have the events of the sixth seal. And the events of the sixth seal are, are amplified in Revelation 12, which we're not going to talk about today. But Revelation 6 describes the sun going black, the moon turning to blood, the stars falling from heaven. And so the pagan Roman Empire suffered. Its pagan leaders, its pagan religious leaders, and its pagan administration were defeated and cast down. And running in parallel to that is Revelation 12. Now, while Revelation 6 speaks about the destruction of pagan Rome, Revelation 12 is going to tell us about the birth of false Christianity with a counterfeit Christ, a counterfeit king, a counterfeit religion, and a counterfeit kingdom of God. That's going to be the subject of another class. With Constantine's conquering of Licinius and the Eastern Roman Empire, pagan Rome had been defeated. Pagans across the empire, from kings to peasants, slave and free, were fearing the wrath of this great uh, conqueror, Constantine. 
And so Constantine was seen as this great conqueror um, and champion of the Christians. And so the words of Revelation 6 mean something now. It says, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath had come and who is able to stand? And so from the pagans' point of view, they saw Constantine as the wrath of this God who was to come and defeat them. And then, um, but, you know, from the, from the Christian's point of view, they saw Constantine as their champion. They saw Constantine as their saviour. He was the conqueror of paganism. For many Christians, he was seen as if it was the presence of Christ himself on earth. Here's a little article um, here from, a, the, from the catholic.org website. And by the way, uh, both the Catholics and the Orthodox, this is a, a, an Orthodox painting, they see, they call Constantine a saint. Now I find that incredible because Constantine, even though he was pro-Christian, he was never baptized until just days from his death. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because the real Christ, the real Christ, before he started his ministry, he was baptized to lead as an example. This guy, he on his deathbed, becomes baptized. And so we read of those words, oh, sorry, those words uh, here in, in Revelation 12. It says, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. I'm not talking literally. Constantine, the, the child of the church, so to speak, uh, was, uh, was, was ascended into the, into the throne. He was this, become the, the sole ruler of the, of the empire, placed in a heavenly position, so to speak. I just read this little article from the Catholic website here. It said, talking about Constantine, it says, he presided over the Council of Nicaea. He gave extensive grants of land and property to the church and founded the Christian city of Constantinople to serve as his new capital. And he undertook a long sighted program, now listen to this, of Christianization for the whole Roman Empire. While he was baptized a Christian only on his deathbed, Constantine nevertheless was genu a genuinely important figure in Christian history and was revered as a saint, especially in the Eastern Church. And I just find that totally blasphemous to hear something like that. And what Constantine began was the Christianization of the Roman Empire. It wasn't law. It, Christianity didn't become the straight, sorry, the state religion until some years later. I was thinking it was about the year 380. But Constantine began that process. Um, here we have a, 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 a picture. Uh, this is a, sorry, it's not a very good picture. Nevertheless, it's a picture of Helena. And she's also revered as a state. Now, who's Helena? Well, she's the mother of Constantine. She's revered as a saint by the Catholic Church. Constantine elevated his mother to a great position of power in the empire. Helena had many churches constructed, including the one uh, in Jerusalem. Um, sorry, in Nazareth, sorry, the Church of the Nativity. The, sorry, not Nazareth, um, Bethlehem. I think that's where it is anyway. And so that was, that was, that was commissioned by her, by, by Helena. And this is a picture in here of Malta. Um, it's, a, it's in the village where my father grew up. And every year a great feast is held on honour of St. Helena. And I remember attending one of these things when I was five years old. And this, I don't know if you can see this, but this statue of St. Helena, Santa Helena they call her, is huge. They're carrying, they're parading the statue through the streets. 
And I remember them worshipping this huge statue as it was paraded through the streets. And so this, this practice of idolatry continues today in many countries like Malta. Just sort of wrapping this up now, um, the Christians thought, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the brothers and sisters here, the brothers and sisters here realised something was going wrong. I'm talking about these are, these are Christians who are belonging to the apostasy or the, or the falling away church, the church that's, le that's left the truth. And Eusebius was one of them. Eusebius was the bishop of Caesarea in the time of Constantine. He, Eusebius was a great admirer, a personal admirer of Constantine. And this historian wrote um, these, uh, these things about Constantine. Sorry, I, I jumped the gun there. I just want to, this is what Revelation 12 says. This is, this is from the perspective of what those early Christians thought when Constantine came. They said, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. They thought the kingdom of God had come. And this is what Eusebius says about Constantine. Look at what it says. It says, and God himself whom Constantine worshipped, has confirmed this truth by the clearest manifestations of his will, being present to aid him. God, you know, saying God aided Constantine. And being pleased to make him a representative of his own sovereign power, he displayed him as the conqueror of the whole race of tyrants and the destroyer of those God-defying giants. Isn't that the words of Revelation 12 that we just read? Right? And that's from Eusebius, who was a, um, an early church writer. He lived in the time of Constantine. Um, and, and this is a, just a, I think this is one of the last slides I have, second last, third last. This is a quote also from Eusebius, from his ecclesiastical history book. This is what he thought about the days when Constantine took the throne. And now a bright and splendid day with no overshadowing cloud irradiated the churches in the whole world with its celestial light. They were deceived, brothers and sisters. They were deceived in thinking the kingdom had come. And it began the reign of the church in Rome. It began the birth. It brought about the birth of the Catholic Church. And paganism was gone. The man of sin was about to be revealed. You may remember the words of Paul's prophecy in 2 Thessalonians 2 about the man of sin being revealed. He, remember, the, remember in 2 Thessalonians 2, he spoke about the apostasy or the falling away, the falling away from the truth that began in the days of the apostles. The seeds of error were sown all the way back then when the virgin woman of pure faith was being corrupted. She got pregnant and she gave birth to the man-child. The church was born and the man of sin was now going to be revealed with the removal of paganism. This is what the Apostle Paul spoke about when, when he said this. He said, now you know what is restraining. All right? Paul wanted to reveal the man of sin. He says, he says, but what's restraining that man of sin being revealed is paganism. Because it was the pagan Roman Empire was hiding the fact that the man of sin was going to be revealed. Now you know what is restraining, paganism that he may be revealed, that's the man of sin, that the man of sin may be revealed in his own, own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, that's pagan Rome, will do so until he, pagan Rome, is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, or the man of sin, 
will be revealed. And that is the subject of the next classes. Right, so the sixth seal, what the sixth seal achieved was the end of pagan Rome, but the beginning of Christian Rome and the counterfeit kingdom of God. And that's where I'll leave it there, Michael.